In this segment, Bobby and Renee tackle key passages that point to a qualified man leading in the local church. They look at 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 5, 11, 7 through 10, 14, 29 through 37, 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, and Bobby and Renee describe how in the ancient world, people participated in pagan worship in unisex fashion. They discuss the often debated authority of prophesying compared to teaching. And Bobby shows how in the Corinthian cultural context surrounding some of these key passages, how it helps us interpret the cultural context. Bobby describes the specific role of the elder in the local church and that there's a gender specificity in the biblical mandate on eldership. I'm going to take you through three key passages, maybe four, that talk about the unique role of qualified men to lead in the church. And I'm going to cover a lot of material fast, and some of you may be saying, wait, what What was that? And uh, we'll try to answer some questions, and then we have more resources on this one. So the first one is this. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and uh, there's two sections in 1 Corinthians where women are going to be um, told how to honor male headship in the local church. In 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul begins this way. I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So you have this... uh, uh, headship authority thing. By the way, uh, notice when you, if you try to make head source and you say uh, uh, the head of Christ is God, God is the source of Christ, that won't work with the concept of the Trinity, which the Bible teaches, because uh, eternally you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, so there's no way that the Father is the source of the Son. But he's the authority over the Son. Again, in 1 Corinthians 15, we are told that uh, Jesus is going to turn over the kingdom to the Father so that the Father may be supreme in all things throughout eternity at the end. So the head of the man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. So because of headship in the local church, he goes on and says, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Now, when we read that today, we go, what on earth is he talking about? Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered uh, dishonors his head, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. So right, right away, we're in a world that's not like our world. So I want to take you back to first century Corinth. Uh, and I want to show you a couple of statues, and uh, we've got more information on all of this. So this is, uh, I believe this is Marcus Aurelius, and you notice how his head is covered. In Roman Corinth, in the first century, when you were praying to your god, in this case it would be a pagan god, or you were making sacrifices, you covered your head. The Greek expression is katakephale, uh, according to the head. So there's a covering according to the head. Notice this next uh, 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 inscription from the first century. They are making a sacrifice. In fact, they're going to sacrifice a bull, if you can see it there. And you notice the man who is making the sacrifice has his head covered. It's like a hoodie over his head. So when it says the covering of the head, that's what it's talking about. So when we go back to this verse, or these verses, if you'll notice, uh, what God is saying is that first he's saying that women did pray and prophesy in the presence of men. So when the Christians would gather, women would both pray and prophesy. Sometimes really strict complementarians will try to say that women can't even do what Renee and I are doing right now. Uh, And what we consider is that this is the equivalent of 1 Corinthians 11, where Renee is sharing, but she's sharing under my authority as the lead minister or the lead pastor of the church. But what he says here is every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. So in, in, uh, in Roman Corinth, for a man to cover his head 
when he's praying or prophesying, because it's what the pagans did for their gods, he's actually dishonoring Jesus. But then he says that a woman should cover her head whenever she prays or prophesies, because that's how she shows that she is honoring the headship of men in that congregation. Let me go ahead to the next part of uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and try to tie it together. So he says, a woman ought not to, I'm sorry, a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and the glory of God. So there's a real God and uh, to honor a real God, unlike pagan gods, men don't cover their heads. But the woman is the glory of man. Now notice what he says here about the Genesis account and the creation of Adam first and primogeniture. For the man did not come from the woman, but the woman from man. Neither was man created for a woman, but woman for man. So he's going back and he's saying there is a headship authority in the local church based on the created order. For this reason, what reason? The created order. It is for this reason that a man ought to have authority over, I'm sorry, it is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head, uh, and he says, and also because of the angels. The idea there is that in the ancient world, the, the angels were watching, and I think it's true even today, angels are watching what we do, and proper order in the spiritual realm matters to God. Now, the natural question about all of this, then, people will say is, well, then, should we have women who cover their heads? In the first century, a woman covering her head communicated that when she's doing a religious act that may look like she's throwing off authority, covering her head shows that she's under authority, in this case, under the authority of male leadership in the local church. So she would cover her head. Today, in our culture, covering your head does not communicate what it did in Roman Corinth. So when Harpeth Christian Church was started, we made a decision. And here's the decision. We're going to allow women to do the equivalent of praying and prophesying. And the whole conversation around prophecy, uh, I'm just going to summarize it by saying prophecy in the New Testament did not have the authority of teaching. And uh, we're going to come to that in just a second. So you can see prophecy had to be weighed and evaluated. When uh, we made the decision that when we have women doing the equivalent of that, we're only going to ask women that we know they believe in male leadership, they honor the leadership of their husband, and they honor the leadership of the elders of the church. And so that's been our way of doing our best with that question. I'm going to move on to another passage in 1 Corinthians uh, that uh, is important in this, and it's 1 Corinthians 14. So in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, the Apostle Paul is describing how they would prophesy and they would speak in tongues. If you will, pay attention. I believe this starts in verse 26. No, it's 29. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is being said. So in, in their assembly there would be prophecy. He said two or three should speak. And then he said it's to be weighed. Now, in the first century, when people prophesied, it was to be weighed and evaluated. Who were the people doing the weighing and evaluating? The people doing the weighing and evaluating were the spiritual leaders of the church, the elders or the evangelists, the, the, the minister. They were, to, they were to weigh out and evaluate, as it says in 1 Thessalonians, test prophecy, or in 1 John chapter 4, uh, it says, uh, test the spirits. So there's a weighing that goes on. If a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop, for you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. So he says, if you have a prophecy, you can actually stop it. Uh, it's not like when you're prophesying by the spirit that you can't stop it. You can. He says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. So he's talking about prophecy. 
when prophecy is going on and there's the weighing of prophecy, notice what he says next. Women should remain silent in the churches. The Greek word for churches here is ekklesia. It's, it's the, what we call the service. Uh, during the service, women should remain silent. The word is, uh, it's the Greek word hesuki. It does not mean absolute silence. There's a word for that we're going to come across. It's sagao. This is hesuki, which means have a quiet demeanor during the weighing and evaluation of prophecy. Uh, women are not allowed to speak during that time where there's the weighing and evaluation of prophecy, but must be in submission as the law says. What does that mean? Well, we've already seen what it meant. It meant the creation account because uh, the order that uh, he just spoke about earlier in 1 Corinthians 11, that Christ is the head of man, uh, man is the head of woman, that goes back to the creation account as we've seen, which is his reference to the law. So during the weighing and evaluation of prophecy, women are to be quiet. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the assembly in a questioning way, is what he means, during prophecy. Then he says, uh, uh, or did the word of God originate with you? In other words, you don't get to make up your own rules. Or are you the only people it's reached? No, there's churches throughout the Mediterranean world. If anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let them acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the Lord's command. You doing okay, everybody? So I'm going to summarize 1 Corinthians, uh, and I know I'm covering a lot here. Thanks for being patient. I, it's better to give you the big picture than to get bogged down in all the details. So in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul teaches... When women do the equivalent of praying or prophesying, they're to show that they're under the male leadership, the male headship of the local church. In 1 Corinthians 14, during prophecy, and we can talk about whether prophecy is for day for today or not. There's a lot of debate amongst that about Christians. We've taken the posture that at Harpeth Christian Church, we're open to that kind of thing, but we're discerning. There's certain biblical criteria that should happen, but one of the criteria is during the weighing and evaluating of prophecy or the equivalent, it's a male headship role, and during that time, women are to be uh, to have a quiet uh, disposition. My next uh, passages, I want to take you to 1 Timothy chapter 2. So I'm covering the three hardest chapters in the New Testament on this topic, 1 Corinthians 11, done, 1 Corinthians 14, done. Now we're going to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And then, Renee, you're going to jump in and save me if I made uh, <laughs> uh, said anything wrong. Sounds good. So starting in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul writes to this church in ancient Ephesus, and he says this, therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Uh, you would not know this necessarily when you read it, but when he says, I want men everywhere to, to pray, uh, there's a Greek expression used there for everywhere. It's the Greek expression topos, which was actually shortly after this we know, uh, a scholar named Everett Ferguson documented that that expression topos was uh, used to describe a gathering of Christians in the assembly. So the presupposition that most of us take with this, and I think rightly so, is this is an assembly of God's people. He says this, I want uh, men to pray, lifting holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want women to dress modesty, modestly, that coming to church shouldn't be a fashion show where we're trying to sh where women are trying to show off uh, with decency and propriety adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. He's not saying you can't wear gold or pearls or expensive clothes. What he's saying is, though, it's not a time to show off external appearances. This is something I, I realize in even mentioning it, we don't talk probably as much as the New Testament would have us talk, that we, we uh, want to have a... Um, we're not trying to be known that we uphold all the fashions, and uh, we try to outdo one another with how we look. Uh, 
uh, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. And then he says this, starting in verse 12. He says, uh, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. Uh, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. So what he's saying here is that uh, in the assembly, there is a teaching role, and that the teaching role, which is coupled with authority. There's a big debate about the word authority here. It's the only time this word for authority is used in the New Testament. The typical understanding of it is its teaching, which is authoritative. So pause for a second. In the time of Jesus, in the synagogue, the rabbis were the teachers. Rabbis were males. Why were they males? Because the role for a rabbi was based on Old Testament priests. In the Old Testament, all the priests were males. The pagan religions had female priests. The Old Testament uh, system that God set up only has male priests. And male priests were not just butchers where they killed animals and made sacrifices. Uh, Male priests were those who taught the word of God to the Israelites. So that role of the male priest became the rabbi role, which is the exact type of thing that we see going on here with the Apostle Paul. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. This word, uh, this is actually uh, the word uh, hesukia. I made a mistake earlier. In 1 Corinthians 14, it's the word sagao, where she's to be silent during the questioning of prophets. It's absolutely, she's not to talk. This is more of a quiet disposition. Now, so he has just said something that is scandalous. It's scandalous to people when they come into the church, they say, what? I can remember when I first uh, was learning this type of stuff. I had just become a Christian. I was studying Greek right away. We were going through these passages, and I remember writing in my Greek Bible, this is not going to sell well back home. (laughs) Uh, But as we've seen, if the created order is important to God, and God's teaching that the created order is important to us, It only makes sense if the husband is the head in the home, that the, that male leadership, there, there's a headship role for male leadership in the local church. So a woman is not to be the prime teacher or the authoritative teacher. Now, can everybody see in the text that's up there the reason Paul gives for it? Before I read what he says, he does not say, because in that Artemis cult there in Ephesus, women are all getting messed up, which is what egalitarians and mutualists will do. He doesn't say, this is just a temporary thing for the culture of Ephesus there. He doesn't do that, does he? When you look at the text, he gives the reason. And what is the reason? For Adam was formed first and then Eve. God has a created order. It's primogeniture. That's the reason. And that's a transcultural reason. It's not just for the situation in Ephesus. And then as a case in point, so the first is, here's the reason, the created order. And then as a case in point, Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. He is not saying that women are more susceptible to negative influence. What he's saying is, as a as a case in point, as a precedent in history, don't forget what happened when men didn't show the kind of leadership they were supposed to. You remember what happened with Eve. Don't let that happen again. That's all he's saying. And then he says, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with pro- pro- propriety. I think what he's saying there is that if women embrace... Uh, the God-given role of women, typified by childbearing, not saying there are lots of women, godly women, who never had the ability to have children. He's not saying that you somehow have to have children to be saved. He's saying you'll be saved from 
taking the role of the God intended for men if you embrace the role God gave for women typified by childbearing. Mm -hmm. Renee, do you want to add anything there before? That's great. Yeah, I think um, a couple of thoughts. Um, the Dr. Oster, who I interviewed um, for this these chapters um, in our book, um, with those uh, pictures you showed, yeah. he, he was saying that um, pagan worship was a unisex affair. So they were actually behaving in interchangeable ways in Roman Corinth. You know, men covered their heads and women covered their heads. It was kind of just unisex. And Paul's like, no, we're not interchangeable. It's really That was really cool to me yeah, that he yeah. pointed that out, that the people participating in the worship, male or female, were having their heads covered. And he said, don't act like that in the church. Act like a man and act like a woman and live out this headship and strong help that God created. And I do really appreciate the... Um, the clarity that Paul gives us, that Adam was formed first. He goes right ahead and gives us the reason. It's not a cultural reason. And then he moves right in into the very next chapter in 1 Timothy 3. He starts talking about elders. When Right after mentioning authoritative teaching, which an elder is supposed to be able to do. That's right. So it's, it's really Let me. I'm going to cover the eldership thing really quickly here. This session's going a little bit long, but we'll make it up in the next one. So in the uh, Bible, uh, God teaches us to appoint permanent leaders in the local church for the role of, we call it elder, but in Scripture, the role of elder equals the same as the role of pastor and equals the same as the role of overseer. There are three Greek words, and by the way, what I'm saying to you now, a lot of people don't hear it often, but it's a consensus of biblical scholars, like this is not a debated point, uh, that an elder, it's the Greek word presbyteros, uh, overseer, episkopos, and poimen, which is uh, pastor, that those three words are used to talk about the same group of people. And those people are all males. Now, this passage that we're looking at here would already tip us off, right, that elders would need to be males or overseers or pastors should be males because they're the only ones, according to this passage, that can do the teaching. I want to introduce you to something that's happening. It's happening here in the Nashville area. I'm very sad to say that the Otter Creek Church, for example, and Woodmont Hills Church in Nashville and other churches that used to uphold complementarian teaching have caved to the culture and they're giving in and they're trying to say that women can be appointed as elders. So I'm going to give you five reasons why you can't really do that. The first one is they explain away 1 Timothy chapter 2 <clears throat> and they say that this was a temporary situation just in Ephesus. The problem with the temporary situation is the Apostle Paul never says the situation is temporary. He says it's based on the created order. Now, let's assume, though, that for a second they're right, okay? So that in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, he's just saying that this is a temporary restriction. Why would he go on in the next verses and say, women can't teach or exercise authority, but they can be elders, they can be overseers? It, like, makes no sense. The second reason why it doesn't work is that when he describes it, contrary to what people are saying, there is a gender specificity in the adjectives for the people listed here. So he says this in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach. So uh, if we're appointing elders, as we will do here in the church, we bring before the church these criteria. He's to be above reproach, faithful to his wife. In the Greek text, it literally says a one-woman man. This is the second reason. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, when he wants to talk about women, he uses the opposite expression. Instead of a one-woman man, he uses a one-man woman when talking about a woman. So if he wanted to do that, he would have let us know that. But then he goes on and he says, 
uh, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle. The word not violent there is a word of, of a man. It's, it's actually in the masculine gender, and it can actually mean a brawler. Do you remember what you said to me yeah, about this? like not a striker. I was like, how many women do you have to tell not to punch somebody? <laughs> and he said, well, I've known a couple. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, no. <laughs> a, uh, able to teach. Notice the teaching component here. Uh, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Then notice this. And uh, these are actually gender specific. The language in the Greek text is uh, you could have made it female, but it's male oriented. In fact, here's the weird thing. So I have friends who are a part of these churches, and I have friends who are scholars who are telling churches to throw off these restraints, you cannot find any major translation of these verses who puts it in gender-neutral terminology. And the reason you can't, and even versions like the New Revised Standard Version, which progressive churches love, even the New Revised Standard Version doesn't, because you can't make the Greek do that. So he says, he... Very specific man. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Anyone who does not know how to manage his own family cannot take care of God's church. He, again, uh, these translations all have it in the masculine. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same ju judgment as the devil he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind it up there. The, the reasons are he's not going to say uh, women can't teach or have authority, but then turn around and say, but they can be elders. I don't care what you do with chapter 2. You can't put those two things just flip like that and, and make one thing say the opposite of the other. The second thing is, when it begins, it talks about a one-woman man. That's male-specific. And then as you press through the rest of the, the text, it's male-specific. The, the fourth reason is that in the early church, and we have a uh, pretty consistent expression, the, those who were discipled by the Apostle Paul in the churches established by the Apostle Paul and all the other apostles never appointed women elders. And then lastly, uh, it just would totally mess up the whole package of Scripture which repeatedly teaches this concept of male headship in the home and in the church. So can I say one thing? We have 12 seconds. Yes. So uh, I speak to elderships from time to time about this topic. They're going through kind of trying to decide what they want to do. Do we want to, how much do we want to have women participating and do we want to have women elders? And the sentiment generally is something like this. Well, you know, it's not like gospel level important here, right? Like there's the gospel and then there's like some important issues and what we think about men and women, you know, it's, it's important, but it's, it's okay. You can believe your thing and I'll believe my thing and it's all going to work out fine. But that is really flawed thinking. And you actually don't think that way in the rest of your life. So if I said to you, it doesn't really matter um, where your children go to school. What matters is just that they're educated. Public school, private school, home school, it's all the same. It's all going to come out. You know you know that the experience of children in each of those situations is going to be drastically different every single day of their lives. The way they live their lives, based on where they're getting their education, is going to look very different. And you know that living in America, in a democratic republic, and just saying, you know what, that's the bullseye issue, we, we got that right, it doesn't really matter who you vote for for president, it's all going to be the same, we can just go live our lives, Reagan, Carter, you know, it doesn't matter, it's all going to be fine. You know, fundamentally, that that is not true, that secondary issues affect your daily life, really important to get it right and to just go in and say, well, you know, it's kind of tricky to read, and they say that too. We can't really understand it. It's kind of complicated. So why don't we just err on the side of letting women do a whole bunch of things? Because to your point, your question earlier, JP, men have been kind of meanies in the past and kind of bad, so let's make up for it. Yeah. That's really bad thinking. 
that's really bad thinking. That's a bad kind of repentance to think you can't pick up your Bible and do what it says or that making these kinds of decisions, that everything's going to kind of just settle the same for everybody, no matter what we decide. It's just not true. 